<laughs> Welcome to this edition of Let's Play. I'm Sprocket, and this is episode one of The Dungeon of Dread, an endless quest series by Dungeons and Dragons. This book is full of 80s goodness, reminiscent of the Dungeons and Dragons cartoon series back in the 80s. Together we're going to brave through perils hidden in subterranean caverns and make key decisions that will determine the course of our adventure and its outcome. I can't wait! Come on, let's get started! Welcome to a journey into the world of fantasy. This adventure into the Dungeon of Dread is a Dungeons & Dragons adventure. You will find a complete adventure between the covers of this book with many possible courses of action. Some choices are simple, some are sensible, some are foolhardy, and some are dangerous. You must make all the decisions. Remember, your choice determines the outcome of your adventure. In this book, you play the part of a human fighter. As an adult, you stand 5 feet 9 inches tall and weigh about 150 pounds. You are smart and have survived many adventures using little more than your wits. You are well schooled in the use of weapons and are a powerful opponent. You carry a sword and a dagger and wear a long sleeve green tunic over leather breeches. Fine leather boots guard your feet. A long green hunter's cloak protects you from the cold. You carry flasks of oil, a tinderbox, a length of rope, and other gear in a leather pouch tied to your belt, and food and water in a sack slung over your shoulder. Good luck and good adventuring. You have stopped for the night in a strange forest, tired after a long day's walk. The area seems eerie and strange. There is no moonlight, so the shadows are very black. The air is still and heavy. Even the unusual night noises of small birds and animals are missing. Ordinarily, you would have passed on through the dark woods to the nearest town, but this night you are too tired to take another step. Wrapping your cloak firmly around yourself, you lie down upon a soft bed of moss with your sword close at hand. You are soon fast asleep. You dream that a summer breeze ruffles your clothes. A strong breeze tugs at your cloak. You awaken. Breeze? There is no breeze. The night is calm. Your reflexes scream in alarm and you awaken. Eyes snapping open, you see a three foot tall halfling probably a thief, quietly searching your clothes. In one smooth, swift moment, you jump to your feet and grab the unlucky halfling by the scruff of his neck. The halfling's eyes shine in the moonlight and his fear is easy to see. Well, halfling, can you give me one reason why I shouldn't feed you to the crows? Oh, please don't do that, whines the halfling. I'm just a poor, hungry halfling named Larousse. I'm no danger to anyone. Why, I just now escaped a terrible fate. If you spare me and feed me, I will tell you where to find all the treasure in the world. You hesitate, then lower him to the ground, saying, I have no need for all the world's riches, but what you say intrigues me and sparks my interest. I will spare your life and feed you if your story interests me enough to pay for my lost sleep. But I warn you, if the tail does not, I will feed you to the crows. Carefully watching the halfling, you gather dry wood from beneath the trees to start a fire. Soon, you and the halfling share its welcome warmth. Its bright light holds back the shadows of the night. You brew mugs of strong tea as the halfling falls ravenously on a mutton leg and round of cheese. He eats as though it's been years since he last saw food. Halfling. You spoke of treasure and adventure, you urge, trying not to show your curiosity. LaRousse wipes his mug with a grimy finger, searching for any sugar his tongue might have missed. All the while, his large brown eyes flicker about, calculating his chances for escape. He studies the strong grace of your movement, your mirror-bright shield glinting in the firelight, and your sword hanging within easy reach, its hilt polished with use. Wiping his mouth with the back of his hand, the halfling sighs and stares into the flickering fire. Aye, tis true, 
Tis a marvelous tale, and truthful too, but there are hardly any who will believe it when I get back to my home. Well, try me. I'm always ready for a good tale, and you still owe me for dinner and your life. I'll tell you, says the halfling, fixing you with a shrewd look. But you may wish you had never asked. Settling back against a tree stump, a faraway look comes into his eyes, and the halfling begins his tale. I've lived around these parts all my life, and a right pleasant place it was until the magic user showed up. Calaman, he calls himself. No one knows who he is or where he came from. One day he wasn't here, and the next he was. Things soon began to change for the worse. People grew poor and sickly, crops withered, and livestock weakened and died. And throughout our troubles, the magic user grew rich and powerful. At last, people had their fill. Gathering their courage, they came upon Calamon in the middle of the night, burned his house down, and drove him from the town. He fled to these woods and claimed them as his own. We townsfolk stay far from the woods, but travelers who choose not to listen to our warnings enter the woods and are never seen again. I was always too smart for my own good, sighs the halfling. One day, I decided I would learn the secret of the woods, the missing travelers, and perhaps figure out how to kill the wizard. If I could do that, I could return to the village a rich hero. So one morning, without even a goodbye to me, missus, I slipped into the woods. I explored every inch of the evil woods and found nothing. Finally, I came to a mountain just outside the forest. I was cold and tired, so I crawled up on a ledge of rock to rest. I was going to sit for a moment before I went home. I must have fallen asleep, for the next thing I knew, I woke up to find Calamon standing over me. So you wanted to find me, halfling, he said. Well, now you have, and I'll wager you'll get more than you bargained for. With a wave of his hand, he put a spell on me so I could not move, and slung me over his shoulder like a trussed up rabbit. Then we slipped through an opening in the side of the mountain. I cannot and will not tell of the frightening things I saw. I don't even want to think of them, shudders the halfling. He carried me to the very center of the mountain, maybe the center of the world for all I know. And there I saw all the treasure in the world. You wanted to rob me, said Calamon. So look upon my treasure. You will always know just how much you have lost. Those who seek danger foolishly always find it. Those who know how to handle both danger and wealth are few and far between. You are lucky. I feel generous. I shall let you go and not even change you into a newt as you deserve. When you return to your home, none will believe you. Your friends will think you have been drinking fermented corn juice in the woods and have made this story up to cover your absence. They will laugh at you. Only you will know what you have beheld and lost. Now be gone. Black smoke came out of his fingertips. When it cleared, I found myself in these dark woods, alone and hungry. LaRousse stares into the fire for a long time, without speaking. Finally, he rouses himself and says with a shaky laugh, You can see now I'm just a poor halfling of no harm or help to anyone. You feel sorry for the forlorn little fellow and are curious about both the evil wizard and his fabulous treasure. Strangely enough, you do believe the tale. Even though the little man is clad in a grimy patched cloak and has one toe peeking through his tattered leather boots, his eyes hold a stubborn look that says, I'm not a quitter. Life has used the halfling hard, yet he has courage. If he were given encouragement and a fair chance, he might prove a worthy companion. LaRousse, you say gently, could you find that opening in the mountain again? The halfling stares at you for a moment before he answers. Surely I could, but it would mean your death. Calamon would not allow you to survive as he did me. I was just a moment's amusement, but you would be a serious threat. Anyway, the monsters would get you first. They're scary. I don't remember them clearly, but I remember enough to give me nightmares for the rest of my life. You're crazy to even think about going in there. You couldn't get me to go back in there for a million zillion gold pieces. 
You fold your arms and stare at the halfling, tapping your fingers against your shoulder. LaRousse shakes his head and says, I see nothing I say will persuade you. As the wizard said, those who search for danger will find it. Who can tell? You might even succeed where I failed. I will take you to the rock. At least it will prove that I spoke the truth. Gathering your few possessions, you quickly break camp and follow the halfling into the dark woods. The night is dark. Without the halfling's knowledge of the way, you would be hopelessly lost. Trees loom out of the darkness, brambles clutch at your leg, and sharp stones cut into the soles of your boots. At last, the mountain rises before you, silhouetted against the night. The halfling searches about for a while, then cries, Naha! Here it is! A large dark crack looms in the mountain before you. You turn to the halfling, almost expecting him to have disappeared, but he has remained faithfully by your side instead of scurrying off into the night as soon as you have found the opening. Halfling, what will happen to you if you return to your village? You ask. The Roos laughs a bitter laugh. <laughs> if I tell the truth, me missus will scold me. She's a hard woman. If I don't tell the truth, she'll still yell at me for disappearing and not talk to me, although that would be a blessing. I will just go back to being little LaRousse, the baker's helper. LaRousse, you say? It took great heart and courage to try such a dangerous task. Would you consider joining me on a second adventure? Calamon will never expect you to return, and with your assistance we may defeat the evil wizard. If we succeed, you will return home a hero. Thereafter, you would be known as LaRousse the Brave. The halfling looks down at the ground, his shoulders sagging. I couldn't do it, he whispers. I'm not a fighter. Pick somebody who won't let you down. I don't want somebody else. I need you, and I want you. You can do it if you believe in yourself. After a long pause, the halfling looks up into your eyes and pulls at his beard. Do you really need my help? Do you really think I could do it? I'll be honest, I'm scared. Much of what I saw seems like a nightmare to me, all scary and creepy and blurry. But I would like to be LaRousse the Brave. A real adventure, he muses. One that might actually succeed. You're strong and handy with your weapons. I bet you're tricky too. More of a challenge for that wizard than I was. But I've been there. Maybe I could help. Maybe I could do it. What do I have to lose? Me missus scolds me and others laugh at my size. There's not much to lose and lots to gain. His voice fades as he thinks to himself. Finally, he shouts. Yes, I'll do it. I'm your man if you want me. Can you handle a weapon, you ask? I've had little call to use one as a baker's helper, but I know the basics every child learns, replies, replies the halfling. I'm loyal and very strong. Well spoken, LaRousse. I have met giants who bore the hearts of mice. People should never judge a man by his size. The things that matter, truth, loyalty, courage, and honor, will never be found on a yardstick. The halfling smiles up at you, his round eyes rimmed with bright tears. Come, come, no time for tears. Now then, I am called Carrick. Clasp my hand and let us swear our loyalty to each other and to our mission. The halfling slides his small leathery hand into yours and soon you swear the oath. Well, you say, there's no reason to stay. Let the adventure begin. You look at the stars and breathe deeply of the clean, crisp air. Then, with your hand wrapped firmly around the hilt of your sword, you step into the opening. Inside, all is quiet. It appears a simple cave, even though the halfling's tale sounded true, you question it just for a moment. As your eyes grow accustomed to the darkness, you see a skeleton leaning against the wall in one corner, staring at the opposite wall. A small shield lies at its side. With a little polishing, it might shine as brightly as your own. You pick up the shield and give it to LaRousse, also handing him your dagger. The halfling takes the weapon and shield, holding the dagger gingerly with his fingertips. <laughs> it's not going to bite you, you say. Hold it firmly. Be ready. 
Do not strike until you are certain of your target, and once you do, do not falter. I'll do my best, LaRue says, putting the dagger in his belt. I'm scared, but I won't let you down. He begins polishing the shield. Your eyes follow the skeleton's gaze and see a message scrawled in red on the wall of the cave. Watch the water that is not water, and beware the basilisk. The rest of the cave is empty, except for a pile of leaves and twigs in the west corner, and a hole in the wall under the message. Well, Larousse, where do we go from here? you ask. I do not know, the halfling replies. I do not remember any trails, just some of the things I saw. If you wish to investigate the hole in the wall, turn to page 13. If you wish to check the pile of leaves in the corner, turn to page 15. Okay, so here's our first major decision. Are we going to investigate the hole in the wall or check out the leaves first? And I'm thinking the skeleton looking at the hole in the wall and then he wrote above that, watch the water that is not water and beware the basilisk. That reminds me of The Incredibles. Remember that when Gazer Beam was in the dungeon and he used his laser to carve out Kronos. I think this skeleton is trying to tell us something just like Gazer Beam was. So definitely we got to check out that cave. But I also think, what's it going to hurt to search first? Like maybe there's something important in the leaves, maybe a special sword, I don't know, maybe a hidden lever or something. So I'm thinking maybe the leaves first, and then we're going to go check out the cavern. So let's go check out the leaves. <laughs> 